Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's second meeting of 2019. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item four in private. Are we agreed, agreed. to do that? Agreed. Thank you. And the second item on the agenda is for the committee to take evidence as part of our scrutiny of the 2019-2020 budget. I'm delighted to welcome Rosanna Cunningham, Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform to the committee this morning. And she's accompanied by her officials, Keith Connell. Keith Connell, Deputy Director of Natural Resources, Graham Black, Director of Marine Scotland, Claire Hamilton, Direct Deputy Director of Decarbonisation, and Richard Murray, um, Acting Deputy Director for Rural and Environment Science and Analytical Services for the Scottish Government. Good morning to you all. Um, I'd, I'd like to start off by, by asking um, our first question, um, and it's about the outcomes-based budgeting and preventative spend aspect of things. Um, Cabinet Secretary, how has the proposed spend within the portfolio changed since last year to reflect the evidence of the wider benefits of environmental spend? Um, well, we do uh, um, look very carefully at uh, wider benefits. I mean, obviously, um, uh, environmental uh, protection, improvement, uh, etc., is the core part of what the budget does. But we're conscious of the fact that um, uh, the environment uh, creates uh, a space where a lot of other benefits are also likely to be engendered. And those might be, uh, in some cases, can well be uh, economic benefits. In other cases, uh, will be health benefits. And a lot of uh, the health-promoting uh, side of, uh, uh, of the environment has been uh, getting a greater focus uh, over last year. So uh, the um, uh, investment in green and blue infrastructure uh, is part of that, encouraging a healthier and more active uh, Scotland. Um, and I think we're all conscious of the fact that good quality local green space does make a, a, a huge difference, uh, not least to this, the, the, the NHS in Scotland, because as I understand it, there's been uh, an estimate that we... Uh, effectively save the NHS £94 million a year by ensuring that good, good green space, good environmental space uh, is, is available uh, to people. Um, there's a concept that SNH uses, which is our natural health service. Um, uh, so there are green health partnerships and uh, a green infrastructure fund. Uh, um, there's uh, money being fed through Central Scotland Green Network that targets disadvantaged communities um, where there are stark health inequalities. And if you think about the route of the Central Scotland Green Network, you'll understand how important that work is uh, to good uh, health and equalities outcomes. Um, and obviously, there's a national walking and cycling network, um, which is uh, also increasing the health uh, uh, of users by increasing physical activity. So there's quite a lot that, uh, um, that is delivered through this portfolio and spending decisions that are made in this portfolio that then deliver uh, benefits for other portfolios. Um, and I do like to remind my colleagues of that as often as I can. <laughs> is the government looking at doing any kind of um, research so that we, you know, we can evidence the, these kind of benefits in a, in a quite concrete way, so it's up underpins sort of spending decisions around, um, around your portfolio with regard to the effect that it does have on other portfolios? Sure. Uh, there are, well, I think I've, I've talked uh, about the work that particularly SNH in, in this area is, is doing. Um, the, our natural health programme uh, um, is, is, uh, is working um, uh, hard uh, in all of that. That's a strategic intervention, an NHS green space for health partnerships, of, of which there are now uh, a number uh, across Scotland. Now, these are interventions which we believe uh, and intend to show uh, uh, some of the benefits that I've been, I've been talking about. And there are a lot of people involved in those, not just within this portfolio, um, that interventions will be evaluated 
Um, and the intention is, uh, through that evaluation, it is potentially to deliver and identify practice which can then be embedded in future uh, policy and practice. Um, once the evaluations have been completed, we will consider future research in this area. So at the moment, it's still uh, uh, um, uh, being worked through. Um, the work will be evaluated, and I would anticipate that it's not just, you know, from my perspective that the work will be evaluated. I, I would hope uh, and understand that the NHS itself will be part and parcel of this. And there are a lot of other partners involved. I mean, obviously, sport and education uh, are, are key to this as well. So there, there will be benefits derived in, in these areas as well as in um, the health area. So uh, we are in the middle of an evaluate, well, not in the middle of an evaluation. We've got these programmes working. They will be evaluated. At the point when that is done, we will then be looking at potential further research. So I can't give you concrete answers about that at the moment, but to basically uh, reassure people that, yes, it is an actively pursued part of what we are doing. Um, and the more, particularly from my perspective, I think the more that I can put numbers and evidence onto benefits that go well beyond this portfolio, um, then clearly the, the stronger the arguments that can be made for this portfolio and this portfolio spend. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I just wanted to explore the health benefits a little bit and the two sides of the balance sheet uh, and just see uh, the extent to which the government is uh, looking at these. Clearly, uh, if people are healthier, take more exercise, they are less likely to be obese and that's meaning you're less likely to have hip replacements, knee replacements, etc., because you don't weigh so much. So that's a, a permanent benefit from that. On the other hand, uh, if you live longer, you have more flu jags, you have more annual checkups. Um, that, well, I do speak for myself, uh, uh, cabinet secretary, if I may, and I hope to. And I hope to have many more of them. But 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 the reality is living longer. Um, creates perhaps in many cases things on the other side of the balance sheet. Because you live longer, you're a customer of the health service for longer. But clearly you postpone the point at which many of the costs happen. So it, it's a complex thing with primary, secondary and tertiary level effects. And I'm just hoping that Richard Murray and his colleagues uh, are, uh, because I'm pointing perhaps at him rather than you, Cabinet Secretary, uh, are, are going to look at the multi-levels and balancing effects that there are in all this. Uh, whereas at the end of the day, I think we can be quite clear that the environment contributes to a better quality of life. That's for sure. Um, okay, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the question was there, but but if I can make some comments. First of all, as I understand it, and none of us here are health professionals, so I need to just make that caveat on behalf of us all. As I understand it, the, 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 the biggest, and I hesitate to use the word burden, but, but that's in a sense where your, your comment almost leads us, is, is actually in the last year of life, whenever that last year is, whatever age that last year is, if that last year is 20, 40, 60, 80, it is always that final year of life where the highest cost to the NHS comes. So whatever you do to make people's lives healthier at whatever age, in my view, is going to substantially reduce the burden uh, in terms of, of health provision, regardless of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of age. Um, and I think that I, I cannot believe that any you know, attempt to do a cost-benefit analysis on this is going to come up with any other uh, conclusion uh, than that. I'd also remind people that it's not just physical health we should be talking about here. It is also mental health. And I, I have actually visited some of the programmes that are being done that are uh, effectively more about people's mental health. Um, and that can be impacted almost every uh, um, uh, stage um, uh, uh, through mental health in terms of prevention, but also in terms of getting people who have, you know, problematic mental health back into better mental health. So it's, uh, it, it's you know, while it might not be a, an actual cure, it nevertheless actually impacts at every, at, every, at every stage. 
as it does with physical health, of course, as well. So um, I, I, I'm strongly of the view that regardless of what age we live to as individuals, we will all be doing both ourselves and the health service and you know, every other one of our services a big favor um, by being in better shape um, and the environment can help us do that. Thank you. John Scott. Um, thank you, um, convener. And of course, I echo the Cabinet Secretary's sentiments in that regard. However, in the response that we got from you with regard to our questions to you over the budget, we I'm just quote it with regard to this in terms of improving air quality. And a, a sentence in the uh, said that, however, an improvement in air quality should increase the life expectancy of people with serious chronic cardiovascular and respiratory conditions, which paradoxically could potentially increase the total lifetime costs of providing such people with NHS care over the long term. Now, that seems to me almost as if it's a matter of regret, but I, I'm not certain how you reconcile uh, it's a, your it, views with this response? Well, but, but, but I, you know, a, a chronic disease at any age, and I think, you know, Stuart Stevenson's questions tend to be predicated on advancing age. A chronic disease at any age is, is, is going to have a big impact uh, on, on, on the health service in particular. Uh, and you, you would really need to speak to health service people to understand perhaps more definitely how that works. Um, improving air quality, um, depending, I suppose, at what stage during that chronic disease uh, that it ameliorated the situation uh, uh, might. But it will also, at the other end of this scale, stop people developing some of these chronic diseases. And that, you know, that's a very complex piece of work, and I suppose is part and parcel of, of why we have to do evaluations of the work that's being done at the moment, um, and and to. Um, and, and, and is actually one of, not one of, but yeah, well, in fact, yes, it is one of the many reasons why I brought forward the, re the review of the, uh, of the Air Quality for Scotland strategy, um, which has now begun its work. So, you know, all of these things have to be looked at, evaluated and considered. But at the end of the day, you know, w w the alternative to arguing uh, that uh, helping people's health uh, become better in whatever way we can uh, is an absolute good is to start applying a, a somewhat less benign view um, that we know uh, that if it's reduced to a tick box exercise will become very problematic indeed. Mike Busco. Thanks. Can I ask how the government deals with the cost of inaction? So we've heard some evidence from Scottish Wildlife Trust that if we invest a million pounds, for example, in tackling rhododendronism on native invasive species today, we save 10 million pound cost five years down the line. So d does government look at the cost of, of inaction, what the cost might be given what you have in the budget this year, what you're planning for? Well, I mean, w you, you can try to do that. It, it's not always just as straightforward as being able to put figures on it, and uh, um, I haven't seen the SWT uh, research that you're talking about, but it's probably not, uh, uh, um, you know, without a debate uh, in terms of whether or not what they're, what they're uh, calculating is, is correct. But I don't doubt that in general terms there is a, uh, you know, there is a, um, there is a, uh, a truth there, even if the figures aren't necessarily easily pinned down. Um, but you have to find the million pounds in the first place. And then in a sense, that's what the budget is all about, trying to find that million pounds in the first place to save the 10 million down the line. And if I have to find a million pounds to save rhododendrons this year, then I need to know within the budget, where can I take that from? And, and that is, is, is always the difficulty. Preventive spend is, is, is what we are always trying to achieve. Um, but it has, has to be looked at within the context of what the resources are that actually are available right now. Um, uh, and, and that's what we're trying to balance all the time. Uh, you know, you could switch... So they're stacking you, up. Sorry? Are there future costs that you think might be stacking up? <sighs> not not putting know, exact There's probably on it. nobody could sit on this side 
uh, of a table and not say there may very well be. I mean, in a, you know, to a certain extent, uh, all the work we do with climate change is about that, is about trying to uh, estimate future cost uh, of not doing what we're trying to spend money to do on, uh, to do on now. Um, but equally, you know perfectly well that if I switch all money away onto what is called preventive spend and take it off current spend, so there's a huge area of my budget which is not that flexible. So people's wages, you know, the, 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 the commitments that we have to do uh, right now, that have to be done right now, uh, uh, mean that every decision I take has got to be thought through very carefully and I've got to be able to work it through in a balance. So um, I don't doubt that spending a lot of money now on rhododendron clearance will save a lot more money in the future. Whether the figures that have been suggested are correct is a different matter entirely. But I still have to find that money now. And that's, in a sense, what the budget conversation and the, and the budget balancing is all about. And, and that's just a you know, an example of effectively what happens across all departments, all, all policy sections and all portfolios. Um, Questions from John Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, and can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and landowner and relevant to this, these discussions. Um, and I want to ask um, the Cabinet Secretary and Mayor about aligning the budget and the climate change plan and how will the new annual monitoring reports and the climate change plan be used by the Scottish Government to inform future budgets? And how will this help to align the budget with the climate change plan? Um, well, we, we are, and I think the committee is probably aware, we are currently considering how to uh, better meet the committee's need for improved budget and progress information. Um, the climate change bill is basically going to, uh, assuming that section uh, gets through, will place the monitoring framework on a statutory footing in future years um, with separate sector by sector monitoring reports laid in Parliament uh, each October. And that's a, a level of uh, um, information which isn't easily currently available. Uh, and uh, will be available. Um, I, I'm aware that the uh, uh, committee has, uh, uh, has uh, shown an interest in this, um, and I certainly think it would be worth discussing both the content um, and timing of those sector monitoring reports during the process of the bill, um, of the climate change bill, and, and it may be that the committee is already looking at some of that in terms of its uh, stage one. Um, and what we're going to also do is uh, set up a new governance body uh, to oversee the monitoring and implementation uh, of, the, uh, of the climate change plan. Um, that's going to review monitoring information. It's going to assess progress against policy uh, outcomes, um, and it will provide advice as well. Um, and that will include advice on whether or not we need adjustments. Um, to any policy and how the adjustments might be made. Um, so uh, that will, as that begins to play in through the, 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 the whole process, that will begin to give us a better understanding when we're thinking about budget decisions as to um, what uh, is needed uh, and where in a better way than we have at the moment. Okay, thank you. But if the committee has particular uh, kind of ideas on this with you in our letter to you and you said in your response that you would welcome further discussion with the committee so we're giving you that chance to discuss it with the committee here and now yeah but, but I, I, I mean obviously it, it, another it, time. it need well it, you know it's not a kind of one-off question and answer is it's, it's a it's a perhaps a, a, a kind of longer uh, uh, um, process um, okay. uh, you know, because we're, we're, you know, we're at the we're at the founding stage of that new way of doing it. So it's going to take a little while for everybody to get their heads around whether or not it's working as well as it should. To me, at any rate, that the timing of these um, reports would have to be a sufficient and reasonable time to be able to influence the budget and the yield that they're presented. So. That's maybe a conversation that that. Yeah. 
everybody needs to just have and think about whether or not you know the the, the current proposed timing is the right timing mm -hmm. um, uh, how how best to how best to adjust that if it's felt that, that it's not um, I, I you know um, that that you know we've chosen October I think because we think that is roughly I mean the draft budget isn't usually published until a little bit later you want to say something clear thank you Ms Cunningham the date of October was chosen um, on the advice of stakeholders. Um, it was a proposal from WWF that this should happen in the October to coincide with one of the usual statements. But we're very open to discussing that timing with the committee to make sure that it meets your needs as well as ours in terms of the information provision. Um, I couldn't speak for the committee, but it would seem to me perhaps earlier might be more beneficial. But anyway, as you say, a discussion perhaps for another day. Uh, my second question to you, um, Cabinet Secretary, is that given that infrastructure investments can lock in a pattern of carbon emissions for many years to come, what have you done to ensure the government's pipeline of infrastructure investments is aligned with Scotland's climate change targets? Well, we are um, uh, committed to increasing the proportion uh, of the capital budget spent on low carbon projects at each budget until the end of this parliament. And I, I understand that there's a new infrastructure commission um, already established to provide long term strategic advice. And uh, there may be a conversation to be had with my colleague Derek Mackay uh, about some aspects uh, of this. The, uh, um, that infrastructure commission is going to give the whole of government uh, advice on um, national infrastructure pro priorities. Um, and uh, that will not just be looking at inclusive economic growth, but also low carbon objectives. So that is a whole government response to, uh, to this. Um, I mean, obviously, um, from my perspective, my portfolio doesn't have uh, a, a huge infrastructure uh, spend um, that 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 is 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 you know is the kind of infrastructure that is being talked about here, um, but the government as a whole is approaching this um, uh, across all portfolios, um, and the infrastructure commission I think will be key to that. So therefore, that cost of that infrastructure commission won't necessarily be a cost that will be allocated to your portfolio. We would hope. I'm not conscious of anything uh, in terms of funding the Infrastructure Commission having come up out of my portfolio. I can't see where it would have come from, um, and I've certainly uh, 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 no. That doesn't. It, it's not being set up on that basis. It's being set up in the appropriate portfolio, but it is a it is a whole government Infrastructure Commission. I mean, obviously, there's a number of portfolios who are who are involved in infrastructure. Uh, uh, um, planning, so it can't simply be a, a commission that reports only to one portfolio. It doesn't report only to one portfolio, but it's not funded uh, across all the portfolios. Um, uh, I, I think there's an infrastructure investment plan uh, um, due as well. I don't know quite when. Again, it's not my portfolio, so I don't have dates for that. Um, and that, again, will uh, reflect the commitment to low carbon uh, projects as well as inclusive growth and I'm conscious that I've got a debate this afternoon on a on a on a slightly different but related topic if you like yes okay. thank, you. thank you convener and good morning cabinet secretary and and um, to the panel um, I'd like to turn our thoughts to the circular economy and in our pre-budget scrutiny, our committee encouraged the government to consider what more could be done to bring forward work for the circular economy, um, which is obviously very important for a, a very wide range of reasons. Um, and uh, in view of this, um, is Zero Waste Scotland, in your view, sufficiently resourced to deliver the Scottish government's circular economy ambitions, um, given um, all it has to do, and um, particularly the commitment to deliver a deposit return scheme, when there's no increase, as we understand it, in the budget um, for Zero Waste Scotland. Um, well, you know, we do task Zero Waste Scotland to, to uh, doing what any uh, public body has to do, which is look at the efficient use of resources and to think about prioritisation. Um, and yes, that does 
it include activity to design and implement a deposit return scheme for Scotland, which is a very key uh, part of my portfolio and, and uh, a priority. But the spend for that will be spread over uh, um, uh, uh, you know, a period of time. It won't, it won't all be happening in the, uh, at the one time. Some of the work is already uh, um, taking place by Zero Waste Scotland, and they will, they will, go, on, uh, they will go on doing that. So, uh, yes, I do um, believe that Zero Waste Scotland is, uh, is able to continue to deliver uh, on its objectives. And, uh, uh, I mean, that... that you know, it, it, it is a budget which um, supports a number of different actions, a number of different, uh, um, uh, has a number of different purposes. Uh, but uh, I do believe that with the work that Zero Waste Scotland is doing to continue to prioritise expenditure across uh, all of the programmes of work, that it will be able to deliver effectively. If we drill down just briefly into the deposit return scheme a bit more, there will obviously be significant costs, I understand that they are progressive, but um, significant costs in terms of um, behaviour change, um, promoting information and, and dealing with any exceptions for rural or small um, uh, retailers or whatever. So I'm just, I, I really hope that, as this is a whole new area, that we will be able to yes, implement are, it. Yeah, we are factoring it in. Um, Zero Waste Scotland is very much, um, obviously, central um, to this. Um, and um, I hope to be able to make some further announcements soon, but, but I'm not there in uh, quite yet in terms of the policy. Uh, um, we've, we're still mulling over the response to the consultation, so we're still at that relatively early stage. Um, and uh, um, Zero Waste Scotland uh, are able to continue the work that is expected of them um, in the foreseeable future. Just um, looking at the budget further in, in relation to um, zero waste, um, uh, in your view, does the budget allow for the necessary preparations for the forthcoming ban on biodegradable waste going to landfill from 2021? Um, and uh, is the government on course to reach this target? Because I did see concerning figures um, earlier, uh, I think yesterday they, they came out, official figures, that um, there was a decrease um, of only 2.2% um, of total levels of waste sent to landfill in 2016-17. So um, I'm, I'm just seeking reassurance for the committee well, on this. Yeah. I, I think the issue here is the drop-in forecast revenues, whatever it's set at, isn't a new... I mean, we, know, we knew this was going to happen. Um, the decisions about uh, landfill uh, uh, were taken before the landfill tax was, was, was devolved. Um, uh, but we are uh, um, aware, uh, and we've always been aware, that we would get to this point. The more successful we were, obviously, <laughs> um, uh, that aspect of the landfill tax, in terms of the, uh, you know, the numbers of, of businesses that were being taxed, etc., would would reduce. Um, however, uh, and for this, I have to go to a different part of the budget, which is not my part of the budget. Um, I'm also aware uh, that, um, that there is an intention to increase the tax per tonne so that, we, we, uh, that we, we, we get some uh, increase in the, in the taxation. Now, that's not principally about money. That's also about not creating uh, what you might call, you know, landfill tourists who might find if we had a lower rate of landfill tax or dumping here from across the border might be cheaper than uh, uh, where it stays. So the increase in tax is intended to uh, help disincentivise any, anybody who thinks that there might be a cheaper option in Scotland. So um, uh, I'm aware of that decision having been made. Um, what I haven't got detail of is, is, is that as a worked through concept um, uh, and I can make sure that you get a, just a follow up. I mean, it, it is in the, in the wider budget, but it's, not, but it's not obviously part of my budget. So I can try and make sure that you get more detail about those proposals. Um, and, and just finally, um, in relation to um, 
possible new environmental taxes or levies um, to fill funding gaps. Are, is, is there, are there any particular thoughts that you would be able to share with us just in, in outline about other possible um, taxes? And, and also, just in relation to that, um, I understand there's an expert panel on environmental sure. charging and other measures, and it would be interesting for the committee to know when that's first going to um, make any recommendations. Well, it's, it's already meeting. Um, I had a conversation with Dame Sue Bruce uh, um, before, just before Christmas. Um, uh, the, the, the way they're going to work is then, you know, I've asked them not to save up all the recommendations to put in one big report at the end of a two-year period. I've asked them to report on a, on a rolling basis, and I understand they're currently looking at coffee cups. So I would anticipate uh, uh, initial recommendations by April, May this year. Um, now, the issue of taxes and levies, of course, uh, you know, has some other uh, um, uh, questions that are uh, attached to it. Um, um, these are not necessarily tax-raising powers that we have, um, which is why the carrier bag levy was a levy and not a tax. Um, however, I'm conscious that at the moment, the Westminster uh, Environment Minister is also, you know, thinking in some of the same areas. So there may be some conversations that I can have about um, perhaps, a, I'm not quite sure what the technical way of doing it would be, but you know, giving us some uh, power to make some of these tax decisions ourselves when it comes to uh, uh, this policy area. Um, but I, I need to wait for the first set of recommendations coming from the expert panel, and that will be, as I indicated, April, May, and it is likely to be around coffee cups. Um, other particular um, areas that, um, as a Scottish Government or as a Cabinet Secretary, you think would be valuable to be considered your, yourself at this stage, apart from coffee cups? What you mean in terms of being other, considered other, by the expert possible, panel? Well, you know, well yeah, but I mean, they, 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 their, their, their work is to look at single-use mm. plastic wherever they mm. find it. Mm. Now, you know, uh, it's a question really then of trying to uh, draw up what is a reasonable work program for themselves and then if you like assign a kind of notional priority however you decide that priority is going to be defined um, uh, they've chosen to go first with coffee cups but there may well, very well be other i'm conscious that there's a big discussion about um, packaging uh, and, and the use of plastics and packaging which is virtually always single use um, uh, and and i would uh, I would anticipate that at some point that is one of the things that they will also want to look at. Um, uh, I, I don't want to tie their hands and be prescriptive about it, but that that will be uh, what they are considering, and they will have they will have they will be in the process of drawing up. Uh, uh, you know, I've given them an initial two years, so they, they, they need to be thinking about these things over that period of time. Um, and the issue would try to be to deal with some of the most problematic ones as early as possible, because that will then help us tease out some of the issues around the tax slash levy debate that, uh, uh, that will bedevil quite a lot of this. Thank you. Say gently to everyone, we've got 25 minutes left Sorry. scheduled with the Cabinet Secretary, and we've still got four sets of uh, subjects that we need to get to from, from members. So if we can make our questions and maybe our answers more succinct, we'll maybe get through a wee bit more. So moving on to questions from Finlay Carson. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, the Scottish Government funding for SEPA has been declining over the, the last few years, and it's set to decrease by a further 1.5%. Could you provide uh, more details on how organisational efficiencies and reprioritis <coughs> excuse me, reprioritisation of spending plans by SEPA has enabled a 28.5 per cent reduction in its resource consumption budget? Well, some of this has been about balancing because SEPA has been um, very successful in uh, looking at its uh, 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 charging regime um, and actually charging where uh, is appropriate, where perhaps that hasn't been the case in the past. And now I'm just using a figure that I think I've seen, and I'm just looking for one of my officials to endorse that we are now roughly in a position where 50% of what SEPA, uh, um, uh, I'm right, okay, about 50% of SEPA's income now is coming from charging. So when, when, you, when you're looking at a reduction, you, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of that has been balanced by an increase in charging. And I, I would assume most people consider that to be 
um, an appropriate way to, pro to proceed. Um, so, I mean, obviously we, we, we will engage with SEPA on uh, business planning, um, but they also uh, have had uh, a fairly consistent engagement with us on better environmental regulation as well. Um, SEPA uh, work very proactively in this area and one of the, we're, I think, the first public body to really engage very much in this, and that was about 10 years ago. So I'm very confident that, uh, uh, that they will be able to continue uh, uh, to manage their priorities and to deliver efficiencies. Um, and as I said, they've had a very great deal of success in increasing charging income to the extent that now half of the income is from charging. And the committee also raised in its pre-budget scrutiny uh, that the performance of Marine Scotland indicator was downgraded from improving last year to maintaining this year. C can you tell us what the actual change to Marine Scotland's budget is, excluding the reallocation of administration costs? Uh, the 2018-19 budget already had administration costs um, in it, an element of administration costs. Um, so the transfer of the full administration budget um, has actually resulted in the underlying Marine Scotland budget increasing by 1.8 million. Now, we're, we're, we're touching on what has been quite a, a change in the way budgets are presented, which is the, 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 the shift in the way that total operating costs are being, are being reflected. Um, and... Uh, um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's quite a technical area, and I appreciate that this year it creates a bit of a discontinuity for people when they're looking at what's happened previously. But the intention is that from this year forward, these figures will all be far more transparent than they have been. So, I mean, you know, in a sense, my initial answer had to show, had to, had to say that actually there were administration costs reflected in last year's budget, but that wouldn't necessarily have been um, uh, particularly obvious from last year's budget. Um, Graham, do you want to say something? Uh, yes, I, mean, I, I think you're, the, the position is a bit complicated in terms of last year, but overall the Marine Scotland budget, in terms of what we're able to spend in operational matters, has gone up by about £1.8 million pounds this year. So that, that's representing um, a recognition that there's quite a lot of Brexit-related activity that's obviously in, involved in the marine area, and also some of our assets, as they get older, obviously require more in terms of maintenance. So overall, a, a, a significant in increase, I think, in the year. Okay, just on, with that in mind, and the, the growing nature of the NPA network and uh, your commitment to consult on four new uh, MPAs, uh, your National Deep Water Marine Reserve, uh, seabird conservation strategy and so on. Do, do you anticipate that the budget will have to grow in the future to deliver these policies and plans? I would like my budget to grow across the board exponentially <laughs> from here on in, but I am conscious that that is unlikely uh, uh, to, be, to be happening. What I am hoping is that Marine Scotland is going to be able to conduct the same exercise that SEPA has done in respect of charging. Um, and that we would then see some of the same results that we have seen uh, from SEPA. Now, so SEPA was the front runner, as I indicated, but that doesn't mean that there aren't potential uh, ways in which other bodies, such as Marine Scotland, might not be able to uh, also do. Uh, so I'm very much looking uh, for Marine Scotland to identify those opportunities, um, uh, including the efficiency savings that we expect everybody to make, and obviously, those additional funds will make uh, uh, will make a difference in the future. Thank you. Um, oh, move on. Okay. Apologies, Mark Ruskell. Thanks. Um, can I ask you some specific questions about land management? So, the Biodiversity Challenge Fund is that included in this budget, and when will it be open for application? Uh, yes, it is included. Uh, uh, um, you know, the the, the 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 funding for it is definitely included in this. It's uh, uh, will be a ma uh, made available, but to projects on the ground, so it will be it will be operated on that basis. Um, we're currently drawing up uh, details of it with SNH uh, uh, between SNH and my officials, and obviously for SNH, this is a this is a kind of key part of uh, what we do, um, uh, and uh, the commitment uh, was is up is for up to two million pounds spread over two years. Uh, and that is definitely um, uh, in, in the budget. I believe 
it's in the bit of the budget that is called the sustainable is it this it's not separately it's not separately it's not no separately it doesn't have a separate time. line but it's contained within uh, one one section of the budget so it's, i'm trying to think where where it, where it is where it is buried. It's Scottish National Heritage. It's, SN it's, SNH. Oh, it's in the SNH funding. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of SNH's budget, I mean, we've heard a lot of evidence about the benefits of a national ecological network. I'm just wondering where, where government priority is on that. And if it's your intention to see SNH develop that network, does SNH have the resources to do it within this budget? Um, well, I'm conscious that there's quite a debate about this, and I know that SNH uh, is meeting my officials uh, in just a week or two's time to discuss this uh, to, to discuss this issue. Um, but I, I, I think th the member will be aware that there is a um, there, there is a conversation to be had a, 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 a around what that national eco ecological network will comprise. Will it be uh, a network of what is existing? Um, uh, will it be a, a reconsideration of what exists in terms of it, uh, in terms of how it's uh, how it's taken forward? Um, uh, there are a lot of people involved in this, uh, and it's not all uh, just government. So the Cairngorm Connect project is is part of this, and that involves uh, uh, land managers who are not necessarily public sector land managers. So um, it, it's a it's a significant conversation um, that is taking place now. I do believe SNH have the resources to develop their thinking uh, on this, um, uh, and obviously it's part of the wider work on biodiversity. Um, uh, but uh, there hasn't been a unified view among stakeholders on what precisely it means, uh, and uh, and I guess we'd have to come to a decision on that before we can make decisions about specific budget allocation to it, because clearly how you define it will be you know quite significant in terms of uh, what money might be required and where it might have to be uh, have to be spent drop in pillar two funding for LFAS agri environment measures leader schemes um, will that impact on land managers ability to improve biodiversity has there been any assessment of what those drops in funding will mean um, well, that's. I mean, that, that. I mean, obviously, there's a number of issues uh, in, involved in that. Uh, since the draft budget was published, uh, members may be aware that um, over 39 million pounds has been awarded to rural businesses uh, under the IX scheme, the Agri Environment Climate Scheme. Um, there's a further round opening this week, um, so that I think has to be regarded as as successful. Um, uh, as well as uh, clearly funded. We intend to continue to deliver the SRDP programme um, uh, and, and obviously the agri-environment schemes that I'm talking about include uh, a great deal of work that is directed towards biodiversity, which is, uh, um, uh, which is a key thing that we need. Um, for most schemes, uh, the budget reflects forecast spend and some of these budgets have been bedeviled slightly by estimates that turn out not to be accurate in terms of what is forecast. Some, some schemes don't get as many applications as you might want, uh, um, so that, that we have to try and estimate, uh, forecast a spend, and that's what the budget reflects. So, um, uh, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think, sorry if I missed anything out there, um, uh, uh, I, I mean, I think that the budget as it currently is presented um, uh, it does uh, adequately deal with these issues. Hanging over some of them, of course, is Brexit and a longer term future. But I'm like everybody else. I have absolutely no idea what's what's actually coming down that line. It, 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 please. OK, I'll, I'll make a combined question then. Um, the budget for <laughs> Woodland Grants increase um, <laughs> to meet the 2025 target, um, what, what will that be? And also with peatland action, um, that's in level four figures, but what amount has actually been allocated? And will it be enough to meet the targets that are in the, the climate plan? Well, you know, the, the Woodland grants, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we consider that the draft budget at the moment contains sufficient provision um, for the 10,000 target. 
uh, for the increase to 15,000 uh, target, that will need to be considered in future budgets. So um, I can't really speak to what that will look like. Um, and obviously, uh, that is part and parcel of that wider Brexit issue that, that I, I spoke about. Um, uh, um, we've currently identified, for Peatland, we've currently identified uh, three million pounds within the budget to support restoration. Um, uh, and I would expect uh, Peatland Action to continue to do the kind of work they do, which is to maximize the abilities across uh, 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 funding routes uh, and partners. But as we have always done with Peatland, we will continue to look for a potential in-year to, to transfer money over. And I think that has been a standard uh, um, uh, kind of function uh, year on year in, in budgets. Uh, there is a delivery pipeline of projects currently uh, taking place. Um, and uh, 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 all of that work is, is, has funding available for it and is ongoing. So at the moment, um, we are, uh, you know, we're content that we can continue to do what we need to do with peatland restoration. I think members, some members, particularly the long, longer standing members, will be aware that the majority of that budget for peatland restoration tend, didn't come from my portfolio in the, in, in, the, in the first place. It tended to be SRDP uh, uh, money um, held in a different portfolio. The three million pounds I'm talking about here is from within my portfolio. Thank you, Convener. Uh, can I take you to research, analysis and other services now, Government Secretary? And the budget for programmes of research resource has dropped by over a million pounds, delivered by efficiency savings as well as resource capital transfer. What are these efficiency savings and how do they limit the capacity to deliver strategic research on environment, food and land? Well, I mean, obviously, individual research institutes need to make a decision about efficiency savings within um, uh, their own organisations. Um, we do ask all uh, research funded grantees to factor in savings of 3% per annum, uh, uh, which should be used to offset any increase in, uh, in costs. It's, you know, it's a challenging uh, climate within which we live um, and the, the research uh, programmes, uh, uh, the research kind of bodies. Um, uh, again, I'm pretty sure if you were to speak to each one of them individually, we'd all want a great deal more money. Um, but we have to try and manage things as best we can. And that's the basis on which we do it. So, so some of these decisions will be, well, nearly all of these decisions will be there for them, uh, for them to make in terms of the, the efficiency savings. I, I don't dictate to them what those deficiency, efficiency savings should be. But with their operational costs now being added into their overall budgets, they've really had quite significant declines in their research budgets. Um, and you know there are there are uh, you know there are there are changes in some of the ways we do research as well, which perhaps you know significantly impact on uh, uh, on on their their work. We use um, a number of. Um, uh, research um, uh, kind of programmes that uh, research centres that we use, um, as opposed to these particular research bodies. So uh, some of the work that might have gone from us to them is not is is is, is going to research centres. Um, you know the the whole research part of the budget is a much bigger thing than simply the funding uh, of the of of these various research bodies. Um, if, the, if the government's moving away from a commitment to strategic research to a more sort of contract-based uh, and shorter-term approach, how will the government ensure Safari and other de others delivering the government's research programme can adequately plan? Are you anticipating continuing a five-year funding programme? Well, we haven't taken decisions with regard to Safari um, post-2021, but you know, for obvious for obvious reasons. Um, uh, and uh, the next cycle of funding for Safari uh, um, uh, will involve working with an independent strategic advisory board and Safari are fully involved in that. I'm very committed to Safari. I, I believe very strongly that it is the right way forward for Scotland. Um, so I'm, I, I keep a, a weather eye on 
uh, what is and is not happening there, because I think Safari points the way to a much longer term uh, solution to some of the issues that, that arise with these various research institutes. A collaborative approach, wherever possible, has to be recommended. In this budget, the, the contract research fund has declined by over 40%, notwithstanding the words. Uh, why is this budget likely to be used less in 2019-20 than hitherto? Um, well, I think this was... Uh, um, I referred to it in an earlier answer. The, the, um, uh, the contract research fund is actually underspent in recent years. Um, and uh, the, the, the shorter-term needs of my policy teams are actually being met by uh, I, I, what would have described as centres of expertise. And the, the one, uh, well, there's a couple that this committee might be more uh, aware of than, other, than others. So the climate exchange, for example, is one such centre of expertise. So um, we, we more frequently go to the likes of the climate exchange when we're looking for shorter term research. Um, and so there's a different way of, of, uh, of, of doing um, what, uh, uh, what we need to do. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of some of the others, the plant health uh, um, yeah. group, the animal health. Yeah, Epic. Yeah, Epic. So, so we're tending to go more towards these centers of expertise when we're looking for shorter term policy rather than to conduct it through that contracted kind of research model that was being used. Uh, and as I indicated, the funding was being underspent um, on contract research. So it seemed appropriate that we, we you know, realign on that. that. Subject, where are you with the plant health expertise, uh, the centre? Where is that? Not my at? responsibility. All right. I think, that's a, I think that's a rural economy responsibility. I think that's a rural economy responsibility. Well, I, I think the point that there, there are a number of these centres of expertise. The, the, the main one that I'm conscious of having used is climate exchange. Um, uh, um, um, and I think there's four in total. Anyway. OK. Um, if there's any further information in the Plant Health Centre of Expertise well, that you're able that. to give yeah. us, then you could I'll let us that. know. Thanks very much. And now to questions from Angus MacDonald. Hey, thanks, um, Camina. I'll be brief. Um, if I could turn to EU exit and the ability of, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the ability of organisations to, to, to leave our funds. Um, you'll be aware that uh, the committee asked for detail of any work, uh, current or planned, on assessing and meeting the anticipated funding gap when the EU withdraws from the EU, if it withdraws. Um, now, you've stated that uh, it is not possible to assess the nature and scale of any future funding gap for the Eclair portfolio beyond 2020. So what risk assessments are you carrying out on the impact of full or partial withdrawal of existing funding post-2020? Well, I mean, that's uh, part and parcel of the work that is currently uh, taking place because, uh, and the committee is integral to a lot of this, we're you know, having to prepare for no deal uh, regardless of what anybody thinks might happen um, and preparing for all eventualities means that we are actually having these conversations uh, all the time. So we're working uh, with SNH, with SEPA, uh, uh, Marine Scotland to uh, actually quantify and assess the level of current EU funding for the portfolio because it's, a, you know, it's an area of funding that's always simply been taken for granted and has been integrated into everything we do. So uh, making sure that we understand the extent uh, to which it has applied. Um, uh, obviously, from my perspective, I continue to be asking the UK government for more detail uh, on what the replacement for that EU funding will be. Uh, but I'm afraid until we know what that replacement will be, it's very difficult for us to be able to make any uh, plans uh, about post-2020. Uh, um, uh, and I await... Uh, with interest, along with everybody else, the outcome of today, but I'm not sure it will help us uh, when it comes to this particular question. Um, and it's a question that really does need to be answered, not just for this portfolio, but for a number of other portfolios um, as well. Indeed. Um, but m more generally, what 2019-20 budget is in place to ensure that activities carried out by 
EU institutions or bodies can be adequately replicated in Scotland in the event of uh, an ordeal Brexit? Well, I think um, Derek Mackay um, has already made clear that uh, the current budget is, is designed to uh, uh, work um, on uh, the basis of an orderly um, exit from the EU at the end of March. Um, I, I think he has already, unless I'm very much mistaken, he's already stated in the chamber that should that not be the case, he may have to revisit the budget. Um, uh, and if that happens, I'm afraid I don't know what the, what the actual outcomes uh, will be. Uh, it may require all portfolios to revisit their particular portfolio budgets. Uh, I would anticipate that it would certainly require um, rural economy and uh, uh, environment, climate change and land reform portfolios to do so. Um, but uh, we don't know yet what we don't know. So um, the, the draft budget at present is predicated on an orderly exit. Um, I, 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 it's very difficult to know what else to say about that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can we... You finished and yes. you've got one more question. I, I want to thank all the members for the questions, Cabinet Secretary. And just one final thing. I mean, we appreciate that the budget has been presented in a different way for the first year. And coming back to our first round of questioning. But could the Cabinet Secretary um, say what additional funds uh, for her portfolio have been given, excluding these ad Is it possible to actually say, excluding the admin costs that have now been added, what additional funds have been allocated to your portfolio? Uh, no, I don't think it is possible for me to say in this year. Uh -huh. I think they uh, anticipate that this being the foundation year for the new way of doing it means that that will be a very much simpler response to give in the following year because it won't be uh, complicated by talking about administration costs that are elsewhere. Um, so um, I, was, I was a little worried that I was going to be asked about this whole total operating cost mm -hmm. um, thing. But the whole, <laughs> the whole point of doing it in this different way is... The whole point of doing it is to make it all very much clearer the difficulty is that this is the year it's done and therefore it's the basis for which the uh, subsequent years uh, um, will be assessed. Um, I, I mean, I can give you, I, I have some figures, not so much from uh, uh, the overall budget is for 2019-20 is 426.6 million uh, and that's compared to 405.5 million for 2018 uh, 19. Um, but I don't think I would want to encourage committee members to, pre to presume that that means there's been a 5.2 increase because I'm not entirely sure that that can be the administration uh, costs. Please, right. please, please, please. Be okay. because, because we're not comparing like for like between the two years and that is the yeah. difficulty. We will be comparing like for like next year to this year but we can't compare this year to last year on, on that kind of like for like basis. Very quick question because we have run out of time. So Mr. then it would be fair to say that if you subtract the operating costs of which there are £63.3 million from the budget of £426 million, leaving you with a figure of £363 million, compare that to the figure for last year of £405 million, that is the level of the cuts of about £40 million to this budget. But Already said that there were some administration costs that were included in last in last year's budget. So it isn't a straightforward like for like um, well, comparison, and there's really not much else I can say apart from the fact that this is a discontinuity. It's a discontinuity that applies across all portfolios because it's a it's a new way of presenting budgets, um, uh, and all portfolios um, are having to deal with with that. So I can't I can't give you. Um, an answer between this year and last year, um, we will be able to be much more clear about it between this year and next year. Can you write to us about that possibly? Because it's far from clear. We are unable to assess whether the budget's gone but up or down. It is because it, it is not possible. I mean, I can write to you, but it will only be an expansion of what I've already said, because there is not a way to do a straightforward like-for-like -like comparison. Um, because of the way previous budgets were uh, were drawn up and the way this is being done. And this way is making it much more transparent. Okay. 
Thank you. We have run out of time. I want to thank okay. the Cabinet Secretary and our officials for the time this morning. We're going to suspend this meeting for five minutes to allow this change in panel. Thank, thank you. you. Continuing our scrutiny of the 2019-2020 budget, I'm delighted to welcome Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work to the committee this morning. Good morning. And he is accompanied by his officials, Simon Fuller, Deputy Director of Economic Analysis uh, to Office to the Chief Economic Advisor, uh, Rachel Gwyn, Deputy Director of Infrastructure and Investment, and Claire Hamilton, Deputy Director of Decarbonisation the Scottish Government, stays with us. So good morning to you all. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to, we, we've, we've been uh, discussing preventative spend a, a lot in this committee and we've obviously asked uh, Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform about this in the previous session. And I want to ask about how you are, 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 are building that into how you allocate budgets across the, the portfolios. Um, has the evidence of the wider benefits of environmental spend resulted in any shift in budget allocation from other portfolios to the environment, climate change and land reform, taking into account that it, it could have an impact um, in preventing spending in the future? 
Now, that's a very interesting question. I think if the outcome and the objective that we're trying to achieve is the appropriate preventative spending to take cost and negative societal impacts out of the system, um, I it's not for me to reframe your question, but to ask is there a simple transfer from one portfolio to another around preventative spend. I think much of the focus, what we're trying to do as a whole government around preventative spend is to say that if it's the right policy, um, it should try and apply across government. Um, so, for example, at transport, so active travel, of course, is good for the, for the uh, health of the nation, health of the individual, health of the environment as well. Um, uh, but transport sits in the transport portfolio naturally. So it's still a, the, the correct preventative intervention, but wouldn't necessarily mean that that line comes from that portfolio into environment. Um, so right across government, there's an approach around the preventative approach, but it's not necessarily as simple as a transfer from one budget to another. Um, Yes. Into the various <coughs> portfolios that impact on the environment. Yes, and in some uh, instances there will be different contributions from other portfolios uh, into a function, and a good example of that is local government. Uh, local government uh, in Scotland benefits from a range of funding streams. It's certainly complex. There's the um, general revenue support, then there's ring fence funds, and there's um, support that comes from individual portfolios to local government. So I just make the point that it's the totality of our approach that's important around prevention rather than an individual portfolio's individual budget lines. If we're focused on prevention, it's what we can do as a whole government. It's really important. The Deputy First Minister leads the Public Service um, Reform Subcommittee for the Scottish Government, where we focus on outcomes. And as much as the budget uh, has the inputs of resource we're pretty unit we are united as a government around uh, outcomes, and I think it's from that perspective we should look at policy. If you look at climate change, if you look at what we need to do for the environment, that's not just the preserve of uh, the Environment Secretary or the Environment Committee for it to be successful. It's a whole government approach, and I think that's the best way that I can address the, the question as Finance Secretary within the government. They will look at the totality of the budget, uh, but there will be instances where there's transfer from one portfolio to another. Active travel was a good example because it's more than doubled uh, in recent years, the, the allocation to uh, active travel for the benefits it brings to the individual and the environment. But as I say, it doesn't fit uh, nicely within this portfolio. I think it's a pretty good example. Thank you very much. Stuart Stevenson, you had a quick question. You wanted to come in the back of that? It is a, thank you very much, Camille. It's just a general question about the whole issue of preventive spend. Uh, clearly, preventive spend is incurred to save money in future. And I just wondered if there is any broad brush sense, because I, I know asking for detail would be a waste of time, as to what proportion of preventative spend results in a cash saving for government and what proportion of it actually is a societal benefit that we can put a number on quite properly uh, in, in terms of quality of life for people and so on and so forth. Have we a sense of how that preventative benefit that comes from preventive spend is allocated in different ways? Because, of course, it's all very well asking the government to spend a million quid for a 10 million quid benefit, but none of the 10 million necessarily comes back to the government. Convener, it's a good question, and I tell you, it would be a consultant or an academic's dream to be commissioned to come up with that analysis. I think the truth is it depends on what the spend is on. So if we're making an intervention, what's the subject matter? I think economists would love it as well to spend days on that very subject. But naturally, it is a general question um, that I mean, you have to spend on the day-to-day, -day, the um, remedies. The, the health service is a good example where we I'm proposing in the budget to, to make a substantial uplift uh, to the health service. That's a mixture of uh, direct and frontline services, GP, but there's prevention as well. Mental health is a good example. Uh, but I think you'd have to look at it case by case rather than say if you invest £10 million, the multiplier is such. It would depend on each individual investment, the nature of that investment, and, and then you could come up with a, a formula or an exercise that could explore it. We've got to get the balance right. So we are at the same time as investing in our public services and recognition of the financial context in which we find ourselves, 
uh, but also uh, turning the tanker, so to speak, as well in terms of the transition to low-carbon economy, uh, protecting uh, and enhancing our uh, environment, recognising that a healthy economy needs a healthy environment, that there is a positive domino uh, effect from pre uh, preventative interventions, uh, but we have to get the balance right so that's not to the detriment of other areas of need at this point uh, in time. So I understand the desire to have more formula around this. It's just, it would be, it depends on case by case, the nature of it, the, st the statistics we would have around it. And, and I think that's the best answer I could give in the circumstances, convener, but I, I, I doubt, uh, doubt Mr Fuller could answer any more than I have uh, given, uh, he may want me to commission work uh, around this, but um, I don't know if you want to convene or if you want to hear any more around the modelling around preventative spend in addition to what I've said, or if, if Mr Seamson is happy with that. Okay, yeah. we're happy with that. Finley Carson has a short question. Maybe he can prove further. Well, Mr McCarthy, you, you're uh, obviously a, a, a gentleman who'd like to see return on, on the money you invest, but also this committee is interested in the working together on the environment, the economy, health, climate change and so ever. So if someone suggested to you you could make a 225% leverage on the money you invest, which would deliver sustainable, inclusive economic growth, would you be interested in that? And if that's the case, why, why uh, is this government not interested in considering additional national parks in Scotland? <laughs> I, I think that's more a question, to be fair. I'm not sure that's a question for the Finance Secretary or for others. I, I was formerly a, a, a planning minister, of course, in, in the Scottish Government. I took a very keen interest in the uh, two national parks uh, in Scotland. Um, I think there is... Um, generally, I want to touch on, on a point around return on investment. Sometimes we do the thing because it's the right thing to do and it's not necessarily about money or financial return, of course. Um, there are other benefits. So, and sometimes we'll make a, a financial intervention that doesn't financially benefit the government, but the wider benefits to society are worth doing. I think there are very specific uh, issues around the request for a further national park um, in Scotland. Uh, I think, um, essentially, that if we have a a planning system that's working well, then we can get the right balance between um, economic growth and environmental protection. Uh, they can be mutually um, beneficial. I'm sure every part of Scotland should also enjoy the, the, the relevant uh, environmental protection that's appropriate in place, um, but we should also celebrate our wonderful natural assets as well. So I'm, I'm sure that uh, Mr Carson will continue to take the matter up uh, with the uh, uh, relevant uh, ministers. One, one thing I would want to say, though, we want to protect our environment, we want to protect every part of our country, but we also don't want bureaucracy to get in the way of our objectives as well. So I think it's important that designations uh, are right and appropriate, and I just say that as a former planning minister with an interest in both the environment and sustainable economic growth. Uh, hopefully that's of some assistance. We'll go back to the substance of the budget now, and questions from Claudia Beamish. Well, thank you, Vena. Good morning. Um, Cabinet Secretary and officials, and I was heartened to hear um, your comment, Cabinet Secretary, just earlier in this session about the whole government approach, um, and that leads us um, uh, on from the previous questioning to the capital budget and infrastructure investment, um, which myself and Mark Ruskell are going to ask some questions on. Um, and in the analysis um, provided by the government to the committee, um, what areas of spend could you clarify for us that make up the 31.8% of infrastructure um, spending classified as low carbon, and then also those that um, are classified as um, the 10.1% of high carbon? I know that. Alone. <laughs> yeah, I know that committee will welcome uh, the commitment we've made around increasing um, the share of, of, of low carbon. Um, spend. I'm sure that that's welcome and that's uh, a commitment uh, that we wish to keep. Generally speaking, I'm sure you don't want me to be exhaustive, but it's the approach that was suggested that we take, that we're following. It is very high level, um, uh, to be fair. In terms of uh, high carbon, it wouldn't surprise you to know that that would be roads and airports, for example, in terms of high carbon. Although, again, there's a debate if we're decarbonising the roads network, and, 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 and surely that's, pardon the pun, but you know, that's the direction we want to go in if we're decarbonising the road network, arguably um, take congestion out, out of the system and making sure that we're electrifying the road network has, has its benefits too. But if you can imagine uh, 
it wouldn't surprise you that for the purpose of this analysis, roads and airports um, are uh, high carbon. In terms of um, low carbon specifically, that would include, for example, rail, ferries and uh, waste and energy efficiency would be deemed as low carbon. But again, it is very high level analysis that we've conducted, but it is the, it is the methodology that, that, that was suggested to us that we're, that we're following. Well, thank you. And I understand, um, if I'm correct, that you've indicated an openness to improving the methodology in conversation with our committee. And I wonder whether um, you have a, a, any sense of a, a vision as to what changes you would like to be making in that respect. No, I don't, other than I say I'm open-minded on this, mm -hmm. uh, having acknowledged that it's high level. As part of the budget negotiations, we were asked to make this concession. We've done that. We were, you know, it was a, there was a suggested methodology. We've taken that. I think that's a pretty open-minded and constructive approach mm -hmm. to which I am continued uh, to uh, continuing to have dialogue. If the committee wishes to explore this further, I, I'm open-minded on that, um, so that we stay on this direction of travel of what we're trying to achieve, a low-carbon economy, uh, and take the harmful effects out. So I, I'm very open to further engagement on this and, you know, in a constructive way. I don't think I can be any clearer than that. And I'm sure that the committee welcomes that. And just to um, turn to um, the Infrastructure Commission and whether um, you can in any way clarify for us the balance of the objectives you have set um, it to, as I quote, significantly boost economic growth and support delivery of Scotland's low carbon objectives and achievement of our climate change targets. But there is a, I know we're going to have the just transition debate later in Parliament today as well, so there's a nice um, uh, follow on from, from the theme of today. Mm -hmm. And it's to suggest that investing in infrastructure uh, doesn't need to be harmful to the environment, of course. It has to get the balance right. Uh, incidentally, just for the purpose of accuracy, Mr Matheson will lead on uh, the infrastructure matters, the relevant secretary for transport, uh, infrastructure and connectivity, uh, not me, but of course I'm cited uh, on uh, the relevant information and would expect that the infrastructure um, commission will absolutely be focused on um, the low carbon agenda and then, and, the, and then the advice that it gives to government will be very mindful of that balance. It is about connectivity, it is about infrastructure, uh, but it will be able to advise on transport, on connectivity, on digital, on any of these matters. Um, but of course we would expect to, it to have the um, a commitment on low carbon uh, as part of its role and function. And, and they will be independent of government, but similarly to the National Investment Bank that I will lead on, there's a, an expectation that's the government's policy, that's the government's drive. We have a climate change plan, we have climate change, but I think our intentions around the environment are clear. And any agency working with us, for us, or working to our agenda should bear that in mind as they conduct their affairs. But again, for clarity, it's the Transport Secretary who leads on infrastructure matters. Right, thank you. Mark Ruskell on this theme. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, mean, I mean, it's good to hear of the, the commitment to, to low carbon investment for the lifetime of this parliament. And I think the analysis that we've had produced by SPICE suggests that we've got, you know, particularly in this year budget, very high um, low carbon level of low carbon investment. But uh, it's less convincing about the, the trajectory going forward. So the question is really about how certain you are, cabinet secretary, that, you know, we're gonna sustain this progress over time. What your own analysis shows I think it's very important to bear in mind that the commitment is around the capital budget and the budget is set year to year uh, and I welcome what Mr Ruskell said around the progress that has been made. I just make the point gently to all members of the committee if the budget isn't approved the spend doesn't happen and we don't make that progress for the environment. It's significant to say that because I think that the investment in transition to low carbon economy, the enhancements around uh, active travel, energy efficiency, uh, we're on target to, to make that commi commitment over the term of parliament. Rail's another significant investment as well. Investment in housing uh, to a very high standard, replacing uh, what was there. So these are all welcome capital investments. As I understand it from UK government, and I saw some of the evidence earlier, and you've touched upon Brexit, 
this budget as proposed is contingent upon a deal, uh, an orderly Brexit. If there's no deal, and of course that's subject to parliamentary votes in Westminster, if the Chancellor revisits his budget, I'll have to revisit mine. The reason I make that point is we have set out a number of multi-year commitments. Housing is a really good example of that. So we've set out resource planning assumptions for a number of years, but generally speaking at the moment, it's been one-year budgets. If the UK government conducts their spending review, and that gives me enough certainty, notwithstanding the complexity around the fiscal framework and the fact that our devolved revenues will be year to year, but if I have more certainty, then I could develop more multi-year funding arrangements. Um, but as it stands, it's a one-year capital budget presented to Parliament. So if I, I approach that for future years, the commitment and the principle stands, but I haven't set out a capital budget beyond financial year 2019-20, and that's why it's hard to say, and here's the commitments that show how you would reach that target year on year, other than to say it's a commitment I want to keep, and they say having categorised some of that spending, that helps influence our spending decisions, doesn't it? If we say we want to keep that commitment, keep increasing the proportion of low carbon um, spend, then that helps us guide us in the budget process. But again, in fairness, I've only proposed the one-year capital um, budget, and so I can answer that question more fully when I'm able to present future year's uh, budgets. You think if you had that certainty, there would be an implicit weighting within that towards more investment within low carbon infrastructure? Are we talking about rail or what, yeah. what, are, we, what are we doing? So, I, I, again, um, I, right now I'm working very hard to get this budget through Parliament for 2019 20. But what I'm saying is, yes, the commitment that we have made as a government, I think, will help direct us in where we allocate our capital spending. Now, there are many demands upon the budget, um, whether that's digital or uh, housing, uh, transport as well. So there'll be a range of requests on the budget. And I have to balance a whole host of dynamics in allocating the budget. But if we set out a principle of increase, as I have done, of increasing the contribution or the share of low carbon spend, then of course that's a guiding principle for me in, in compiling the budget. Be the infrastructure investment board's role in guiding you on that and the commission separate to that so the the commission will certainly advise government principally as i say through the um, cabinet secretary michael matheson and it will look at uh, the demands the transition of the economy the requirements uh, to spend but it has to keep the low carbon um, uh, ambition uh, in mind but what i'm saying is fundamentally whatever advice i am given I am reiterating a commitment in the direction of travel that I've set out. So whatever advice I'm presented with it is still for government and ultimately Parliament to decide if it wants to approve a budget or not. So I'm trying to be as reassuring as possible that it's a principle we're trying to deliver. The useful thing about having an infrastructure commission, it brings that independent perspective to it as well. It will take the time to focus on the evidence, the information then present to, to government and, you know, uh, in the end, Parliament. So that's a very helpful development in terms of infrastructure advice for our country. But it's still Parliamentarians' job to decide how we allocate Scotland's resources through the budget. And it's from that principal background that I'm trying to reassure members that we're, we're staying on this direction of travel. Just a brief question, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And given that your budget is contingent on a deal on Brexit, pres and presumably you wish to see your, your budget succeed, are you urging your SNP MP colleagues to vote uh, for the proposed deal uh, in the House of Commons today? Mr Scott, I feel as if that, uh, that question is a wee bit above my pay grade in terms of instructing my parliamentary colleagues elsewhere. Uh, but I think current, Mr Scott will... to a future pay grade? Well, Mr Scott will... <laughs> well, I think I missed that last question. <laughs> and I think it was good that I did. Um, I think it's fair to understand that the Scottish Government's outlined a, a compromise position to the UK Government, which would keep Scotland in the single market and the customs union. Of course, we would rather have full membership of the EU, but essentially, the Prime Minister's deal is detrimental to the UK and to Scotland. So, no, we're not uh, of a view that the Prime Minister's deal is good for Scotland. Uh, no deal uh, is pretty catastrophic. Um, the Prime Minister either 
deliberately or accidentally has a number of times now mentioned no Brexit. Um, it wouldn't surprise you to know no Brexit sounds pretty good uh, to the people of Scotland who voted to remain within the European Union. And I think the UK government have got themselves in an almighty mess in relation to Brexit. And they have mismanaged the whole process. And it's hard to see what the Prime Minister will do next. She can only answer better uh, than I. But what we're trying to do is get the least damaging outcome for Scotland. And frankly, right now, that is no Brexit. Now, we've set out a position as to how that can be uh, achieved. And we'll have to see how events unfold today and over the next few weeks. But uh, can be, I have to be very clear, uh, Mr um, uh, Russell and I have set out the implications, the economic impact for Scotland. It's damaging environmentally as well. And uh, for that reason, uh, I would encourage the, the Prime Minister to pay attention to what the Scottish Government and many others have been saying. And now we move on to questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just before I ask my questions, and I'm not sure the uh, Cabinet Secretary will be able to answer it, um, but I, I understand the carbon assessment includes an assessment of the carbon impact of imported services and goods. Do, does that actually feed through to the um, uh, UK Climate Change Committee assessment of carbon, or does it exclude carb, uh, imported services and goods? I'm just trying to see if the, we can compare, because if they're different, then we can't. Can I just make one point around the carbon assessment? Because I think it's a really significant point. The carbon assessment of the budget only quantifies that immediate impact or, or in terms of emissions. The reason it's important to understand that, it doesn't then quantify the future effects of that policy or financial intervention itself. That, that you know, comes separately and, and overall through, I would imagine, the, the climate change interventions, the climate change plan. So the reason I make that point, the budget says if you're spending more, and let's bear in mind, despite ongoing austerity from the UK government, this budget proposes a £2 billion increase in expenditure in Scotland eh, on the priorities, I think, that, that we share. So normally what, what comes with increased expenditures and increased um, initial increase in emissions, but it doesn't take into account the future benefits of that intervention. So even if it's a, uh, an intervention that might, in, in particular policy or financial interventions, lead to a reduction in, in, in emissions over a period of time, that's not what the carbon assessment counts. It's just the immediate impact in, 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 in it. Can I turn to Simon for the more um, specific uh, question? Yeah. So, um, so as you say, Mr Stevenson, the carbon assessment includes imported emissions. And that's kind of similar to the carbon footprint publication which we produce, which looks at the emissions associated with overall consumption in Scotland. But as you say, it is different from the overall climate change targets, which the, you know, the Climate Change Committee feed into, which are based only on domestically produced emissions. Yeah, I, I just thought it would be helpful to make sure I and other colleagues had that uh, shared understanding. Well, let me now move on to more specific things that, uh, that I, I, uh, well, it was not intended to be other than general uh, cabinet centre because I recognised the, the, the issue. Uh, but uh, in terms of NHS in, in particular, um, what are the most carbon intensive parts of their expenditure? Or is that the sort of question that really has to sit with another cabinet centre? I suppose, I mean, it's, on any of these specific technical questions, I'm more than happy to get the relevant information from um, other parts of, of Scottish Government. Um, I, you know, in terms of running of the National Health Service, I imagine that a state will be um, the, a substantial part of that um, in terms of the uh, carbon assessment. We're spending more in the, the National Health Service, of course. Again, I'm happy to get officers to, to provide more information if you require it on this. Yeah suggest perhaps that be done, but also I think we're, we're interested in particular in what's happening in the rural portfolio right. um, with the support uh, cap, pillar one, greening payments and so on and so forth, uh, because that's uh, a, a big area. So let me just move on maybe to the final bit that, that we can deal with perhaps just now, uh, and that is in terms of uh, the, the lock-in effects of infrastructure. Uh, investments. To what extent are you being influenced in your spending decisions 
uh, an allocation of funds by those long-term effects. Uh, because we are building roads, um, we are electrifying roads, and that's good in the longer term, but in the shorter term as we build roads, we probably are increasing uh, over a number of years uh, the, the carbon impacts. Okay, I think that relates to Mark Ruskell's question about direction of travel in terms of capital spend. Can I just briefly go back to agriculture just to make the point again that on agriculture, agriculture of course is quite carbon intensive uh, by its very nature. Uh, the substantial spend that we have there around cap payments is for that financial support. Again, a I think that's something that's largely been welcomed. I'm sure that um, Fergus, you in particular, would be more than happy to go through the environmental considerations uh, of that. But, but that's, that's our major financial intervention, those cap payments. And because the sector is so carbon intensive, that would explain um, that, that outcome. Uh, on um, specifically how we're locking in in terms of infrastructure, as I say, the, uh, we're in part guided by the infrastructure investment plan. Um, so that sets out the infrastructure that's required, but of course it's published it in a point in time. Uh, there are developments from that. There have been more developments around the environment, around our understanding of the low carbon agenda since the infrastructure investment plan was last set out. We've also got the national planning uh, framework that I know Mr. Seam is very familiar with as well. So there's a range of policy guides that take us through our infrastructure spending. Then there's demand, then there's the um, uh, circum financial circumstances in which we find ourselves with because there was a change to rail financing that's come from the UK government as well. So these are all material considerations in the year-to-year -year capital budget and in, in aspiring to meet our target around uh, new homes uh, as well. Uh, we're leveraging in uh, some over £800 million in housing. So you have to look at the totality of demands uh, and policy commitments around the capital budget. But undoubtedly... Um, uh, the, we've, we've been delivering in terms of the trajectory on spend on energy efficiency, uh, act of travel, it's been very welcome, we've more than doubled that. Um, the rail investment um, is significant. Um, the spend around uh, electrification uh, on rail, um, and uh, we uh, are proposing to continue investing in, in low-carbon transport. There's very specific funds for uh, low-carbon transport as well. So, although we have the guide of the infrastructure investment plan, as I say, there's been other interventions that have ensured that, we're, that we have a enhanced our position in terms of investment in low-carbon spend as it relates to the capital budget. And one amendment that the committee asked me to make uh, was to include financial transactions in that analysis as well, it, which you have done, and that's part of that figure, which is surely to be welcome because the, you know, the request came from this committee. So I think I'm trying to get evidence that, that we're mindful of it as we take our, our, our decisions around capital. And um, in, in, in some ways, some of the capital spend is deemed as neutral. Um, and digital is a good example of where you could quantify, again, initial investment in digital in terms of immediate uh, emissions of doing the work, but there's huge long-term benefits of a more digital society because it could reduce need to travel uh, and uh, other more uh, harmful impacts to the environment. It may be worth saying it's been suggested that the Edinburgh-Glasgow electrification, we only require 10 wind turbines to provide the power for the entire scheme. Um, and I declare my... Uh, Honorary Vice Presidency of Rail Future UK, a matter that relates to my enthusiasm for railways. Welcome the increased electrification of uh, the uh, rail network in the greener, cleaner, faster, longer um, uh, trains with more capacity. Thank you. Now moving on to questions um, around local authorities and other public bodies from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, as long as the trains run on time, but yeah. Um, can I can just ask about the city-region deals? I mean, obviously, significant investment for both UK government, Scottish government, 192 million uh, being invested in, in 1920. But again, I mean, how do, we, how do we get a grip on what the, whether that's carbon neutral, whether it's high carbon investments, whether it's low carbon investments? Is, it, is the investment in the city deals going to lock in emissions to come? I mean... How does government assess that? Which, which bit of government assesses that? And 
Well, to an extent, again, I think local authorities, to be fair, share a low carbon ambitions. Um, but the nature of city and region deals um, is quite different to just general investment and spend in capital because of the nature of negotiation, because they're a deal essentially between UK government, Scottish government and the local authorities and other partners as well. I mean, some, some examples where um, uh, the spend, if you take an earlier deal, like the first deal was Glasgow, um, I was a signatory to it as a, as a local government and planning minister. It felt very heavy on infrastructure. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But the more recent deals have arguably focused uh, on jobs and skills and you know, with Edinburgh, for example, around the bio quarter or, or digital. So you see how the, the deals are very specific to the locale, the nature of the, uh, the negotiation, the, the desires of uh, the economy in that part of the country, but there's always the expectation of low carbon. But I suppose in the essence, I don't have a specific measurement of the city deal arrangements, um, because that's, there's a degree of empowerment here. You know, the government can't be accused of, you know, centralising in relation to the city deals and then saying we're holding local authorities to account on the carbon assessment of it. Uh, but they all share our, our low carbon ambitions. So I don't have a specific assessment of what the city and region deals uh, will uh, uh, in terms of emissions. Again, if the committee wishes me to explore that, that's a slight change to how we have overseen the um, arrangements around the city and region deals. But again, you have to understand the premise that they are about partnership approach to lead to a deal which then invests in a, in a, in a region or part of the country. Um, so it's not, although government, of course, is a key player and, of course, is a, a, a key funder, um, I haven't got a separate set of monitoring arrangements. That may well be uh, resisted. There is a gateway process. Uh, there is that partnership approach. But I'm just being clear with committee that it's different to that you know, mainstream capital spend that the government is directly responsible and accountable for. If the information was available, would that not help on the on the decision making about, in particular, transport projects that are getting into city deals or not? I mean, as you say, it's a negotiation with partners. Um, it's not all about the Scottish government or UK government. But would it not help to have that carbon information available? Yeah, it, it may well be helpful. But each business case, indeed, for each project, is taken through the negotiations and the arrangements for each city and region deal. And I just say that. Um, I, it will depend on the project and it will depend on, on the deal, but you know, the, the world has moved on. We absolutely uh, have, have clear environmental commitments. We expect them to be followed. We'll negotiate them out, but I'm, I'm just expressing the difference in the early deals to the deals we have now, and they have shown the focus on the low uh, uh, carbon uh, transition. Uh, indeed, um, some of the work that's underway right now is to absolutely support innovation and innovation uh, around our environmental objectives as well. Um, so we didn't need the assessment to, to lead us to that conclusion, um, but you know, further information may well be helpful. I don't want to go back necessarily, and, and again, this is, this is as much or more a matter for the infrastructure secretary than me who leads on city deals and infrastructure, but we wouldn't necessarily want to retrofit new monitoring arrangements, but I understand the desire to, to know more about what the city region deals are contributing by way of emissions. I'm just being perfectly clear that we didn't say, out, here's the assessment that you'd have to undertake to, to enjoy that deal. But I think everyone's very mindful uh, of those uh, demands as we've, we've, we've taken the deals forward. And as I say, that they are evidenced by, by, by some of them being about innovation and um, taking us to the circular economy, the low carbon economy, digital innovation, better use of resources, so on and so forth. Maybe for our colleagues in the local government uh, committee as they scrutinise the city deals. Uh, Claudia Beamish, I'm aware that you might have wanted to come in just for on that brief, theme. On, brief, yes. um, it, it was just to uh, ask you, Cabinet Secretary, about public sector climate change reporting duties. And, and I think, is there a working group on, um, on, uh, on, uh, on climate change reporting? And I wonder if... If that comes up with recommendations about concerns about the public sector, um, to put it bluntly, will there be any more money for, <laughs> for support for, for um, any initiatives that have to be taken forward? 
I wouldn't um, close down um, an evidence-based case. Uh, I just say that the, the budget, as I've um, presented it, um, is what I would like, of course, Parliament uh, to pass. Uh, but I'm always open to suggestion. I'm happy to engage in any evidence that's, that's brought forward. Um, when any member of the opposition asks me for more money for something, I have to, of course, respond and say, how much? Where's it coming from? What would you take out to fund any amendment in the budget? That's something I would say in principle. Um, I, I'm not sure... Question, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I, and, uh, Party question. <laughs> and Claudia Beamish is playing a part as a committee member, and yeah. I, uh, yeah. uh, I, I'm interested in looking at any of the detail. I don't think the scale of expenditure is massive, again, but that's often what's said to me in any request for funding. It does all add up. But I'm happy to look at the, the, the evidence. You asked, am I closed-minded? No, I'm not. Of course, I have to minority government look at um, concessions as part of the budget process, so I'm, I'm open to engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Now to questions from Finlay Carson. Um, in response to the, the, our committee's pre-budget scrutiny report, the government stated that they were committed to becoming world leaders in development of local energy systems. Um, however, uh, if we look at level four budget figures, um, there is a significant uh, rise in spending, but uh, these are largely contributed to allocation or redistribution of capital from the energy line. So has there been additional support given to renewables and community energy? And this is uh, probably more a matter for um, Fergus Ewan, um, particularly I'd imagine within his portfolio, unless we've got anything it can assist to hand now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Do you want some of the detail? It'd be interesting to find out just to, uh, whether there was additional support out with the, you know, we're looking at an increase of 235% uh, in community energy. How much of that is attributed to redistribution or how much is it actually additional support? Um, so the information I have is that renewable and community energy have received 10.1 million in resource, but that will include 2.8 million in operating costs and 13 million in capital. So that's broadly um, level budget from the previous year. Um, if that's of assistance. I should say, and I think you were touching on this earlier, that generally speaking, um, I have changed how we approach um, administration spending because I think the approach around total operating costs is more transparent. It's covered in the budget document. It's trying to outline the figure for, as it sounds, the total operating cost of government. Um, previously, it was quite complex where we had... Uh, administration spend, so that came from the centre, if you like, to support um, the administration costs of individual portfolios, but still there'd be administration costs and project costs and um, no clear lines uh, within portfolios of that spend. So I think total operating costs is far more transparent, much clearer on the, the cost of operating um, by definition, uh, but recognising this is the year that's been implemented, there is that um, baselining that starts from, from this year, having um, set it out in the budget that I have. So that, that, that's a more general comment that then relates to individual budget lines, which is why it's sometimes quite hard on this occasion to do a like-for-like -like analysis. But again, portfolio can answer more about specifics of, of lines uh, within a budget, if that's of assistance. I, I, I might get the same answer, but um, there, there was additional support given to deep water port facilities, decommission activities and development of offshore wind. Can you tell me how much additional support has been given to deliver the deep water port facility and, and what the timeline is for delivery? So my understanding is that we have around £10 million um, that's been allocated to deliver the deep water port. But again, if you want more information on the progress of that, I would refer it to the Portfolio Minister. Okay. Thank you. And that's questions from Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, Convener. If I could turn to uh, operating costs in the Eclair portfolio. Um, now, we know that the, the new budget document uh, changes approach and all operating costs are now presented within uh, portfolios. So, given that uh, admin, uh, admin budgets, uh, the admin budget no longer exists, can you set out how administration costs have been apportioned to and distributed within the Eclair portfolio at the detail of level four figures, uh, and what is the overall additional administration cost that's been included in this year's budget? 
I think I was trying to say out earlier, though, that it's partly my recognition that the administration budget didn't cover the, co uh, the total cost of administration by definition, because it's, it's, it's essentially what we've inherited as a government as a, and as a parliament, that there would be, within portfolios, individual spend essentially on administration. That could have been programme, that could have been delivering a project or a policy commitment. So. I, I feel that moving to total operating cost is more transparent. It gives you the total cost of doing business, doing government. There's still some central corporate costs. Uh, so we went through um, with portfolios um, what we believe their share um, to be. Again, it's quite a complex exercise because there's still some central costs that portfolios can now uh, contribute to. And for that reason, it is hard to do the like-for-like -like analysis because it would have been an academic exercise to try and establish the um, kind of retrospective administration costs, but this system is much clearer. The other thing about it is that um, before I determined the administration budget and allocated it to portfolios, now as part of a portfolio allocation, it's for the Cabinet Secretary uh, to then look at how they would like that, that element of total operating cost to be allocated. So, for example, if a Cabinet Secretary Minister wanted to spend more on a particular thing and take it from the total operating cost, they have that flexibility. Um, so this is the start of, of that way of doing business rather than traditionally how we've set it out. I'm happy to look and see what other detail I can provide around administration, but as I say, it is very difficult because it's not like for like the system that we've gone from to the system that's being um, uh, implemented as proposed in the 2019 uh, 20 budget. And for that reason, it is hard to just extrapolate those individual um, uh, lines, acknowledging that the, the administration line is now part of portfolio budgets. I will look at what further information I can give to the committee in light of the question and supply that to committee. But th that's the explanation for the change. OK, thanks, uh, Kevin Setti. I get the issue with regard to like-for-like uh, -like, uh, analysis, but I think uh, certainly the, the committee would appreciate further detail. Uh, it would certainly be helpful. Um, but if I could um, maybe use an, an, an example, um, using the Sustainable Action Fund, uh, if the administration budget reallocation to the Sustainable Action Fund is stripped out, um, what can you tell us what's the actual change in resource available for its sustainability and climate change work? And is the SAF's programme of work requiring a reprioritisation re um, because of less resources? Paul, well, if, you, if you look at the uh, wider uh, issue around uh, the environment, climate change and our focus, um, there's clearly a focus on the uh, climate change bill. There'll be the just uh, uh, transition uh, as well, um, uh, commission there, uh, and a range of interventions around adaptation. So I think there's a lot of work um, going on. If you were to look specifically at the, the Sustainable Action Fund, um, and if the administration budget reallocation is stripped out, um, the SAF budget for 2019-20, once total operating costs and corporate running costs are deducted, will be approximately £16.5 million. Pounds. Now, that's compared to a budget of approximately £19.5 in 2018-19. But as I say, what I'm trying to address through the change in administration budget is to have a more transparent, clearer figure around the actual uh, you know, total operating costs. And that's why I don't think it's necessarily appropriate to have that like-for-like -like analysis. And in any event, as I say, there's much wider interventions and involvement around our climate change programme. Thank you. And then questions from John Scott. Um, thank you very much, convener. And can I take you um, to uh, delivering low-carbon infrastructure questions in that regard? And can you tell us, please, Cabinet Secretary, um, provide us with an update on the government's work with Scottish Energy Intensive Industry representatives and what uh, options are there for incentivising investment in decarbonisation or efficiency? Again, I would probably want to refer this to the most appropriate Cabinet Secretary, which is the Infrastructure Secretary. My understanding was, or is, that there was a round table, but again, I think it's more appropriate that the Portfolio um, Cabinet Secretary uh, answers that in terms of developments going forward and engagement with the sector that he would be uh, undertaking. Again, Thank happy to get more information to, uh, to the committee, but my understanding is that there had been a ministerial roundtable. 
Right, so we, um, you will maybe ask him to answer that question for us. Um, just on a, on a slightly different subject, but um, nonetheless germane in terms of costs, I know we've got an infrastructure commission planned, a public energy company, a just transition committee and the land commission. What are the costs of all these new quangos? Hey, that other people, including the opposition, tell us they support, I have to say, Mr Scott. So it depends on the nature of the organisation. I give you, it, it also depends on their formulation. Um, uh, the uh, trans Just Transition Commission, again, it's been called for. I think it's been welcomed. Um, we'll probably say more about that in the uh, chamber later today. But if we are serious about protecting the environment and getting that independent expert advice, then surely the uh, range of bodies are to be um, welcomed. So as we uh, develop each one, we then uh, compile the costs uh, so to do. Um, again, if there's a range of costs depending on if something's uh, advisory, the nature of it, or if it's statutory, so on and so forth. So. Um, the government does have, uh, of course, an ambition uh, to uh, uh, reduce the number of quangos uh, in Scotland. Uh, we have been achieving that uh, since we came into office. But again, in recognition of the priority to which we attach the environment and transition to a low carbon economy and to get the best possible uh, advice around infrastructure, that's why it's been established as a need for, the, for these um, um, bodies. Uh, and um, we'll look at value for money, of course, and the committee opened on preventative spend earlier today. So good advice if it leads to better and good decisions and ultimately um, better outcomes, then it will be value for money and a worthy spend. Um, thank you. And a supplementary question from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, I wanted to ask you whether you're considering any new fiscal powers for local authorities that could help with raising revenue. Um, for local authorities, but could also help with the decarbonisation agenda? Essentially, um, as Mr Rusko knows uh, very well, I've set out the um, budget that I'm proposing on behalf of the Scottish Government. Um, this is a minority government, and we will have to find a compromise, of course, for the budget to be passed. Um, so I'm open to opposition parties engaging in the budget process of negotiation so we can find that necessary support that the budget can be passed with the benefits it brings to Scotland as a whole, as I say, over £2 billion additional spend in our country. Uh, and that's worthwhile. So this is the stage in the budget where I am open to engagement from political parties. Uh, it's no secret that the um, Greens, the party to which Mr Ruskell belongs, has made public statements around and progress on local taxation. Um, and so um, that has been raised and now continue to discuss with parties as we as we take the, the budget forward. So I think, as I've said publicly before, I am open to engagement with political uh, parties to, to uh, see the budget passed. Um, thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, just is there anything else that you would like to say in relation to the allocation of the budget to this portfolio before I let you go? No, I'm here to answer your questions. Uh, the only thing I, I would say, though, is that uh, the budget is set in the context, because it is worth mentioning, that if you take the health consequentials out, um, what I was dealing with was a very challenging settlement from the UK government and that ongoing austerity from the UK government. But despite that, I've still been able to make an allocation to this portfolio um, that I think will uh, keep helping us deliver around our uh, climate change uh, uh, aspirations, our ambitions, and make the right investments for Scotland. Thank you very much. I'm now going to suspend the meeting briefly to allow the Cabinet Secretary and his officials to leave.